Hey everyone, I'm David Brashears. I am the VP of Growth Services at Sapper Consulting. Um, and I'm here today with uh, three very good friends of mine. Uh, Dion Mishler, the CEO and founder of Inside Sales by Design. Say hello, Dion. So everybody will know who you are. Here's Dion. Um, Brooke Simmons, who is the Director of Enterprise Strategy at Outreach. Hello. And Shannon Gregg, the president of Cloud Adoption Solutions. Hey, hey. So for the past few weeks, Dion and Shannon and Brooke and I have been meeting. Uh, and this really started with a conversation around sort of just COVID-19 generally and what it means for revenue organizations. Um, and we decided, you know, we've got some things to share and a webinar might be a good way to do it. And we really started by talking about the things we didn't want to do. Um, we didn't want to have another webinar where we tell you how to lead with empathetic communication or that you need to rejigger your target list and think about your accounts differently. Um, there's a lot of information that's been done and probably overdone a little bit. And instead, um, we thought of this notion of being exposed and thinking about that metaphor of what a virus does to a body, right? It ex you're exposed to it. It makes you sick. But in the process, uh, you get past it. And in doing that, you build up an immunity to the problem. Well, in the same way, um, we can think about what exposure did. Oop, let me get on the right screen here. We can think about exposure from the perspective of what happened to our business. Very much like a virus, uh, our businesses were exposed. Um, we were deprived of the shelter and protection and care that we've had for the last really solid eight to 10 years where it was just all green lights and growth. Um, and we got very comfortable and we probably got a little bit complacent. And when COVID-19 came along, we were suddenly subjected to uh, some harmful actions. Uh, things started getting a little rough and we realized that it could no longer be business as usual. Um, what really happened was we were exposed in a second sense as well, and that is the gaps in our businesses, the things that had been you know, just sort of going along well because everything was going along well, suddenly became points of weakness and vulnerability. And so what we brought to the table was a conversation about um, what we've learned in the process of going through this period of upheaval um, and trying to take away from those lessons a series of blueprints that we could use to make our businesses more resilient, to build what we call our businesses crisis immunity. So in the same way the body begins to fight off the virus after we've had that initial exposure, we think our businesses should be able to fight off weakness and become more resilient by taking the lessons of the past few months and turning them into a set of very practical tactics and strategies that will make us better off over the long term. The framework that we're going to use to talk about this is really three components that we think are universal to any revenue organization. Um, you've got your content, the things that you use to communicate to your customers, to the market, your value propositions. These are everything from the emails that you use to reach folks to how you present your product uh, on the website and anywhere else. It's the process that we use to organize our sales organizations and to run our revenue machines. And it's the enablement that it takes to put that content and process into action, to make everything actionable, to teach our reps and our managers and our leadership how to actually make that revenue machine hum. And so today, uh, Brooke and Shannon and Dion are going to walk us through content, process, enablement. Uh, and we're going to start by talking about um, where we were whenever the pandemic happened, what we've done in the past month or two. So there was sort of an initial reaction. We all immediately went into battle station mode and started doing things. And we've come out of that a little bit. Now there's sort of a where we are moment and we've all sort of stabilized a little bit. But where we wanna focus our attention is really where we're going. Um, what happens in the transition back to work? What happens in this new normal? None of us are under the illusion that things are going to end anytime soon, but instead um, we wanna take the lessons that we've learned over the past few months and turn them into some practical actions. And so I wanna turn it over to Brooke Simmons to start the conversation around content and what we've learned. Awesome, thank you, David. So before uh, we dive into content, a little bit of context about um, where this is coming from. So I am with Outreach and we're a sales engagement platform, but um, we work with thousands of sales organizations to help them streamline their team sales workflows. And so when uh, COVID-19 hit at the beginning of March here in the States, right, we started to see some initial impacts 
um, the reaction was really strong on, okay, uh, we know that what we're doing isn't working now, but we don't know what to do. So we spent a lot of time throughout March, right, consulting with these, our, our customers to say, hey, you know, we're going to break down our value props. We're updating our personas. We're changing all of our content. The messaging of February no longer works in March. Overnight, things changed. And now we've reached, as David said, a little bit of a, a status quo right now where we're operating from home. The world is different. We, we, we understand that things aren't necessarily going to go back uh, overnight in the same way they impacted us. And so we're starting to see people say, okay, we're in this for the longer haul. Maybe we taper off some of that initial COVID-19 focused content, um, you know, change the messaging to really focus on the rest of 2020. And some of the biggest things that I'm going to be talking about today as far as where we're going are two key programs that I think some of our clients who weathered that where we were and where we are really well had in place um, prior to the impact of COVID-19 hitting their business and then how you can take these two programs into your business to make sure that you're ready for any change that comes in the future, right? Um, so that's, that's the big thing we're gonna be talking about here. Now, um, I'll come back to that in a few minutes, but I'm gonna turn it over to Shannon to talk a little bit about her process journey and what she's seen in the past two months. Awesome, thank you. In my experience working with sales teams who are trying to optimize their process, specifically process that is lubricated by their sales technology like salesforce.com, we've found that every year people generally go through the same motions. They're looking at their accounts and their resources, the administrative staff that they have to support them, their forecasts and all the things that sort of go along with that. That's a motion that everybody sort of goes through sometime between October and January, sometimes a little after that. <laughs> but the sales operations side of it to say, where is the process? How do we fix this process? Where is the process that we usually set inside of the very beginning of the year got demolished at March. So what we thought was gonna happen in Q2, Q3, all of a sudden came right in front of us to say, how do we respond now? So what we're doing right now is looking at our non-prospecting workflows and saying, how do we hone those in? How do we make sure that those are giving us what we need? How do we give our sellers everything that they have to deal with what is happening right now? And then after that, we're going to move into what we think is the future and you'll hear us all talk today about how we're going to look to say this is the future how do you future proof knowing that something like this may happen again for those sellers out there that have been selling since 2008 we've seen it before we're going to see it again so we're going to invite you and i'll tell you a little bit more in a bit how you can revise processes to fix those gaps that this crisis exposed for you so that you don't get caught one more time the next time that this happens so I'm excited to tell you about that, but for now, I'm going to let Dion tell you why you've got to hang on and hear what she has to say. Oh, thank you. You guys are amazing. So we, where we were was really talking about how do we talk to folks and all that good stuff and, and where organizations are at from a selling culture perspective are definitely, they span the spectrum that we have from boiler room to consultative to caring and everything in between. And what we just, just like Brooke and Shannon were saying is when this happened, there was a big slap in the face and this sudden stop at the end of the day and a very much a, um, an emotional flooding of holy cow, what do we do? How do we do it? What's gonna happen? So on and so forth. And so organizations, there were phases really focused on, okay, work from home. What do we do? How do we do it? Business leaders looking at the business, reps looking at their business, hopefully right sales leaders. And so what we wanted to make sure we were doing was, okay, now that we are working from home, number one, did we have a system within our organization, if we were all in the same space, whereby we were in a continuous motion of, just like Shannon was saying, that um, we all have motions, we all have movements, um, but as humans, we don't always change until we feel the heat. There was a lot of heat back in March. And so um, one of the, so a lot of what we're gonna talk about is the systemization of continual learning at the end of the day and leading into how do we commit to developing an organization that is robust. Do we have the fundamentals in place? Are we committed to those fundamentals? Are we communicating and collaborating on them so that we can take our content, we can take our process 
And again, put that into a function for our team to use as lines on the road in order to be better, right? So all three of these things really work in harmony to create a revenue generating organization that can withstand um, some of these really big blows and impacts that have come and, and really shook us all at the end of the day. So with that, Brooke was talking about some of her content and some of the, the programs that she was going to walk you through. So I'm going to flip it back to, to Brooke for that. Thanks, Dion. So let's talk a little bit about some of those programs I mentioned um, that are things that some customers of ours had in place prior to COVID. And we saw a markedly different ability for them to kind of weather the change that they had to adapt to in March. And I think these are programs across the board um, that everybody should have in place. They were things that exposed a desperate need for across a lot of our customers where they went, oh my gosh, we don't have this right now. We know as, as Shannon Dion said, this is not the last time we will have to pivot on a dime potentially in the near future. So we need to build up some immunity here. We need to build up the backbone um, to really have an established content program. So operationally getting ready, what that looks like is we're going to talk about two key programs, a regular content review and a content change process. And those things are underpinned by you having visibility and measurable KPI on your content. So if you don't know what's working at a baseline, really hard to enact these things, right? Um, the roles and responsibilities of who owns this, it doesn't just sit with one team. So it's really important that we're talking about the marriage, especially of sales, sales enablement, and marketing throughout this. Everybody should be looking at content KPI. Everybody should be sharing this. And everybody should be able to look at it at any given point and say, okay, we have a source of truth around what good really looks like from a content perspective. And we're supporting each other cross-functionally so that we can make decisions and pivot according to what we're seeing in the data. So some metrics I'll call out that are really important that I would encourage you to dive into in your own business. So one, just content usage. What's the team using? Uh, more common than not, uh, there is a, some sort of a communication gap, let's say in a nice way, between what we think the team is using and what's actually happening on the floor. Especially today, since the floor is everybody's home office and they're not right in front of you, it's really important for you to understand just what is getting shared by your sales team. Um, and that includes across multiple channels. What are we sharing via email? What are we talking about on the phone? And what are we sharing via social or any other channels that you might use? Um, just understanding really what's happening on the ground floor is super important. Don't make any assumptions there. Do a virtual desk share with people if you have to to understand what's actually getting sent out. Now, once you know what's getting sent out, you can start to say, okay, what's performing, right? Two typical content KPIs here, but reply rate and open rate. Um, very important for you to understand just what's happening at a basic level. Open rate's gonna tell you a little bit about your subject line. Is it compelling? Are people opening it? What's going on? Um, and reply rate is going to tell you more about the body of your email and your call to action at a really high level. There's tons of great knowledge out there in the marketplace about how to compare and, and A-B test and start to really dive into what these metrics tell you. But at a baseline, the goal here is just to get the metric, right, to see it and to understand um, is that what you expected and start to measure it over time. Now, the fourth thing here that I added that's, I think, a little bit more unique to right now is content aging. If the team is still using content that doesn't fit the right now, that's something that's got to potentially get stopped at this point, right? So we do, we have kind of seen some people age out um, content from, say, Q1 or Q4, right, that no longer works. Go ahead and look at, like, how fresh is this content? Does it really uh, match the messaging that we want to have right now? and make sure that it's, it's on par with what you want your team to be using. Now, there's different ways to get these measurements through um, sales engagement tools, through your CRM, um, uh, through BI tools, right? So working cross-functionally, again, it's gonna be really important here to make sure that you have a baseline, even if you're just starting from scratch today, to say, okay, snapshot in time today, keep tracking it every you know, other week, every month, so that you understand how these things are trending. 
Now, let's go on to talk about kind of this two program more in depth that I think are really important. These were the two muscles that some of our more resilient businesses had built pre-COVID that allowed them to adapt much quicker. So the first one here on the left, I wanna talk about a regular content effectiveness review. Typically what this looks like just at a high level is you're sitting down on a regular cadence with these cross-functional stakeholders to look at those metrics and say, let's look at the KPIs, what the team's using, how it's performing, right? And let's look at and evaluate the messaging that we're actually using and determine, are, is this what we wanna be doing going forward, right? So having this muscle built of just a really simple process to say, here's the, the data points we look at, here's the content we look at, and here's the ownership model around this, really simple, but it allowed these businesses to quickly pull that lever when they notice the need for change and say, hey, we've got to, we've got to review the content. Um, other folks struggled with this because they started going, okay, well, I don't know, who owns it? Who makes these changes, right? Who, um, how do we get this data? And, and they struggled throughout March to try to uh, get you know, out from behind the curve and it took them several weeks to actually put into place some procedures for their own sales team. Because remember, early March, the sales team's hungry for new messaging and what do we do, what do we say? So speed is really important with that. So having this effectiveness review built um, is really, really important. Uh, I typically see owners sit in the sales enablement space, and that's an owner in like, you know, racy terms, which is the responsible party for making sure it happens, but they're definitely not the only person there. Marketing needs a seat at the table. Sales leadership and management need to be in there talking from the rep perspective and sharing rep feedback. And sales enablement needs to be there from a, you know, a metrics and KPI um, aspect as well. Uh, most of our businesses pre-COVID or customers that were doing this, we're doing this on a quarterly or semi-annual basis at minimum. Um, but you could definitely potentially argue for upping that frequency in times like this, right? And saying, hey, we're going to do this a little bit more frequently given, you know, the, the, the consistent change we're seeing in the market. Now, as a logical output here on the right-hand side, you're gonna have this meeting with your leadership team cross-functionally, and you're gonna talk about, okay, do we like what we're doing? What do we need to change? Now you need a process to actually go execute that change, right? Get the content out to the team so that they can go deliver it. And think about this as an iterative circular loop, right? You know, review the content, look at the KPIs, determine a strategy, you change and then you test again. Review, change, test, right? You keep this iterative loop going. Um, and we should be doing this in times of health, um, let alone times of crisis, right? We should always be doing this. So this is something that I think benefits you now more than ever, but definitely going forward. So the way that we see content change um, happening, typically a little bit more tactical, right? Same folks potentially involved depending upon where your content is stored and housed and how it's shared with your sales team. But from a checklist perspective, you're just looking at, I'm gonna um, identify underperforming and outdated content, lock that off, make sure that's, that's no longer accessible. We don't wanna use it anymore. Um, we're gonna refine and edit the content we do want the team to use, make sure that marketing is bringing in some consistent voice there from what we're saying from a marketing perspective as well. And then we want to deliver that content to the team, educate them, make sure that they feel enabled to talk about those content pieces or write those emails, whatever, however we want them to be speaking. And then, like I said, we're tracking efficacy and usage to make sure that we uh, know if we need to keep adapting or maybe we've hit the nail, right? And we're seeing the performance we want to see. So these two programs work in tandem together. Um, it, it's nice to have kind of that single owner around like a sales enablement resource so they can orchestrate how these programs work together and time them um, as well. But this could definitely be, you know, a couple of different folks within your organization weighing in. So um, I'm super passionate about content in the way that Shannon is super passionate about process and iteration here as well. So she's going to dive into a little bit about how you build your immunity through those process changes. Thank you so much, Brooke. <laughs> and I, I think one of the reasons why I really enjoy 
the prep for this webinar was I learned so much about you and things that really affect me in process. And so I want to start right in the middle in that roles and responsibilities column, because I think when we're looking at sales process, and this is if you're a one person shop, or if you've got a thousand sellers inside of your organization, we touch everybody when we're thinking about sales process and sales operations. So you've got sales leadership who has specific things that they're trying to get to based on what we're looking to do in the year. Now that's all been upended. And so everybody's saying, what do we do now? And when we're looking at our sales process to say, how do we build immunity against this? How do we make sure that we don't run into the same thing again? The first thing I would implore you to do is reach out to your friends and other departments. So I put down here finance, ops, delivery, but I really mean everybody because one of the things that's really fascinating about the sales ecosystem and why I love sales process so much is because we've got our fingers sort of in everybody else's pot, right? So our friends and finances are looking over and they're saying like, we want to know, we have to do some financial analysis. What does Q3 look like? What does Q4 look like? How about next year? And we have to be able to present them with some fact and data driven information to say, here's what we think we can project for you when you're looking at those sorts of things. Our friends in operations are saying, hey, we need to do resource planning. We're trying to look at allocations. We want to understand what's going on. In a very real situation that we're all aware of right now, Airbnb is saying, yes, travel's disrupted now, but travel is going to be disrupted for the, the next following probably forever. How do we deal with that? And so they were able to use really good data coming out of their CRM system that was talking to their ERP system to say, we understand how to plan for operational resourcing. And then everybody that goes beyond that too. So, you know, delivery, supply chain, whether you're a product or a service, you're looking to say, how much inventory do we need? And whether that's something tangible, a tangible widget, or that's somebody's man hours, all of these things hinge on us being able to have really good process to identify where are we going, where are we going to get to, and what happens after that. So, with sales process and sales operations, one of the things I like to talk the most about is begin with the end in mind. And my guess is my friends on this webinar and all of you that are listening do the same thing too, because the best way for us to understand how we can predict our sales is to say, where are we trying to get to? So you might start with something that feels a little arbitrary. Maybe you want to do 20% over the last quarter or the last year, but based on that, you now have to start to do some modeling. So you're looking at sales forecasting and you're looking at all the typical pieces of information that you have in your data to say, okay, what does it cost us to acquire a customer? And now that we're trying to build immunity, can we adjust that? Can we amend that? Are there customers that we want to say, we're gonna niche them out or we're gonna bring them in based on our ability to cross sell, upsell, resell, you know, whatever your model is, how can we use that information and then lubricate our process so that it keeps going the way that we want it to go? Look at conversion rates, look at your customer lifetime value, look at your turnaround time, and then use those pieces of information to go back and reevaluate your process. So now I'm starting in that operational readiness column. I've already identified who's gonna be inside of there. I've also looked at to say like, what is it I'm trying to get at? And now I'm gonna to look to say, how can I get myself ready operationally? So you wanna look at fit for purpose reporting and dashboards. And I gotta tell you, <laughs> working in CRM consulting has taught me that a lot of people like reports and they just don't know why. So figure out, is this dashboard, does this report tell me something that is actionable? So. Brooke mentioned a ton of really good KPIs that she has that you could build reports and dashboards to that will tell you, hey, look, we understand this open rate and we know what that means. We're gonna go back and say, we need more content like this because this is really attractive to the people that we're trying to reach out to. So make sure that your reports and dashboards have a purpose and make sure they're used. <laughs> I've seen inside of a lot of Salesforce orgs that have reports that are older than I am, <laughs> which isn't true because Salesforce has only been around for 20 years, but you know, get rid of those old reports. They are just causing a lot of noise. And if you're not using that data and information to make data-driven decisions, you might as well go back to keeping your little Rolodex where you go through and say, I haven't called on David in a quarter. Let's see if he wants to buy. So stay inside of there and make sure that your reports are giving your sellers information that they need to go sell because that's the point of all of this, right? 
we're all looking for ways to say, how do we equip our sellers with more of what they need at the right time so they can be productive, helpful, and value-added members of the selling ecosystem? So one of the other things I want you to really start to consider inside of this is right-sizing your targets and your territories. So many times those kind of sit aside and it's like, this is the way we've always done it. So this is the way it's going to go. Well, guess what? If you've got people who have been selling to the retail or the restaurant landscape, they are going to feel a crush in a totally different way than the people that you've got that are selling to SaaS companies, healthcare and life sciences companies. So now's the time for you to look and say, do I have a salesperson who's blowing up, who cannot go after and treat our customers and our prospects with the care and attention they deserve and somebody else who's sitting over here withering away and dying. So use those pieces of information to say, how can I make sure that operationally we're ready to deal with this in the future so that if you need to pivot, you can give the best information that's driven by data and not emotions or feelings. And the last thing I'll tell you before I get into detail is this is a brilliant time to look at hygiene for your sales technology. So is your data accurate? Does your data tell you the things you need to know? Remember, you're going to begin with the end in mind when you're trying to decide how that data should look. If that data is not giving you the signals that you need to do something, it's time for you to evaluate it. If that data is giving you a lot of noise, that white noise, uh, those of you that <laughs> are actually as old as me remember when the TVs used to go black and white at night. <laughs> if your CRM looks like that, take this time to clean it up, right? Because otherwise we can't go back to our executive team, our sales leaders and say, here's what we're seeing, here's how to fix it. So on the next slide, I've got four major components that I wanna talk to you about that you should look at when you're trying to build up your business's crisis immunity using sales process. And I threw in here productivity tools and technology because it all fits into the same thing. Again, we're all looking to remove roadblocks from our sellers. We want them to do what they do best, which is care for and cultivate customers. So first, look at your ideal sales process. This should absolutely maximize value and minimize complexity. If you have a 90-day sales cycle and you have 19 stages in your CRM system, forget it. That's not ideal, right? So what you don't want your, your sellers to do is be sitting around like they're the Wizard of Oz behind the green curtain, turning all the knobs to tell you, I just moved from stage three to stage four. Who cares? Look at it to say, how can I make sure this is smooth for you as a salesperson so that as you are out there in the field, you're doing all the things that you need to do without giving me signals that truly don't matter. So think really hard about how you can make sure that your sales process will make their value high and their complexity low. So I'm jumping over to the corner that says ideal sales productivity because that's really what we're interested in, right? We wanna give our sellers the ability to, to do the most high value activities. So when you look at one of their days and you can actually journal, you know, you remember the sales ride alongs when we would get in the car with our sales team and we would say, I'm gonna see everything you do today. Still do that, you can do that now that we're sitting from home. Ask them what they're doing. What are you doing with your day? What are you spending your time with? Block out your time so I can see how much time you're spending on things because if it takes you three hours to enter an expense report because we're still using Excel, that may be something I wanna invest in, right? So look at all of the high value activities and say, do my sellers have everything they need so that they can be doing what they do best and not doing the things that they cannot stand, right? you also can be using all of those signals to look for coachable moments. So if you look at those five sales stages that you have, and you know Dion is doing a great job converting from stage four to stage five, but David and Brooke are stuck back, they can't convert between stage two and stage three, is this something systemic your whole team needs coached on, or is this something specific that you can coach specific people on? So use that data to spend your time wisely as well, specifically if you're in a leadership or executive role. So you'll be able to do that, and that will help you to find the ways to make them more productive, which leads right into the block underneath it, which is your ideal sales technology. So sales technology should be easy to use. The most ideal user interface is one that I don't have to spend a lot of time explaining somebody how to use it, right? When you pick up a smartphone, you're like, cool, I know how to use this thing. That's all of your sales technology should be as well. 
you should be looking for ways to automate so you can reduce human error and eliminate re repetitive motions. So if you can say, I know as soon as a person logs a call against a lead, that's immediately going to create them a task. So they know the next thing they need to do is follow up with an email and some collateral based on the things that Brooke told you are working in a sales cycle. So look for ways that you can put that automation in that will reduce the things that aren't value added and allow your sellers to have more time to do the things that they need to do. And then I'll finish up with the ideal sales tools. So sales tools and sales technology in some cases are one and the same, but in some cases they are completely separate. So if you've got sales tools that sit inside of your sales technology, that's awesome. Look for ways that your sales team can frictionlessly remove every obstacle in their way so that they can get inside of it and use it. If they sit outside, that's okay. Just make sure that it's administered in a way that you can measure. So for example, if you're looking at training or onboarding, which is one of the biggest challenges with every sales team I've ever seen. Make sure you measure what they're doing. Did they understand it? Will they retain it? Do they get it? If not, how can I coach them through it? Look for sales tools that you can give to them like templates, proposal templates, contract templates. It may even mean finding people who are on their team who can help them to take away things that they are not very good at, like creating change orders. Maybe your salesperson has a high value asset and you can bring somebody in an administrative level that can churn that paperwork. Or maybe that's a time that you say, it's time for me to move this tool into technology. So these four buckets are going to help you take all the signals that you get inside of your sales cycle and make it so that your salespeople can keep doing the things that they do best instead of not doing the things that just don't add value to their day or the day of their prospects and their clients. So there is one more piece that I think is going to complete this entire circle for you. And Dion is going to deliver it. And I am so excited to hear from you. Thank you, Shannon and Brooke and David. I mean, this is such a setup. And one of the things that we talked about throughout the course of prepping for this is we want to think about building our immunity and resilience and thinking about this from a um, um, cooking, right? So for some of you that are on the, um, on the phone, on the Zoom call, right, is we're approaching this and looking at this in a very phased way. My operational readiness, who's involved, what are my metrics, right? And so one of the best analogies that we had come up with as a team was being able to say, you know, if I'm going to cook, um, I'm going to make a cake, then first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to assemble all of my ingredients. And being somebody who is probably, my brain works really fast, I have a system. So when I, I set something and when I'm going to cook, I have a place in my kitchen and all my ingredients and everything I need goes in this one spot. And as I add my ingredients to my mixing bowls, when I'm done with the ingredient, it goes to the other part of my counter, like on the other side of the stove right? So I can make sure that I have exactly what I need in my bowl, in the ingredients I need it, and the measurement I need it in at the end of the day. Um, my roles and my responsibilities might be how well do I, you know, where does my oven need to be? Do, you know, what do I need to be doing here? And then the metrics, right? You stick a toothpick in the cake. If a toothpick comes out clean, your cake is done at the end of the day. Very simple analogy. A lot of the businesses we have aren't that simple. However, when we in our brain, think about this from that phased approach, we are able to internalize what we need to do. It's not as overwhelming. And if I'm in a leadership role, I am better able to communicate that to my team. So because I have this system for cooking, I can easily teach it to my kids, right? And that's what we're doing. We're not children. All of us are adults here. However, if for those of us that are in a smaller organization and we wear a bunch of hats, we don't have dedicated training and enablement, the sales leader, that would be you. That's your responsibility at the end of the day, maybe with some folks on your team as well, but really it it's ends up being a team effort versus a, a business unit effort. For those of you that, that are in the training and development world here, I encourage you, you're kind of the in the messy middle of all of this, right? Um, and being able to think about this from a phased approach and being able to communicate, which is also a verb, which I found interesting to what David's first slide was on exposed, is being able to 
communicate in such a way that says for now versus forever. So when we think about in a phased approach, compartmentalizing it for ourselves, our operational readiness. I talked to a bunch of folks that don't have a purpose for their sales team. So maybe that's something you can do. And especially now with all of us separate, you can create a common team purpose. What is the team's purpose statement? For those of you that might be in the Franklin Covey shop, we cascade that to the team and we, we ask the team to create a personal professional mission statement. That's something that Franklin Covey does. But if you're not that, that's okay. Have, create, look at your, your company's mission statement, your company's purpose statement, create your team's purpose statement. And oh, by the way, it's not to generate revenue. That's a result right? Your team's purpose statement as Shannon, and we've all talked about, and Brooke, and David, I don't want my team on there hustling for money because people feel that a mile away. Don't do that, right? You can have a sense of urgency. We want to have quality conversations with people because quite frankly, all of our business is a commodity. Don't, don't, let's not kid ourselves here, right? So what makes us unique is our ability to interact, our ability to deliver, our ability, our ability to deliver an excellent experience. And if we are not clear, if we're expecting to what Shannon was saying, if we're expecting our team to put the lines on the road and, oh, by the way, drive, that's not going to work, right? And so Brooke and Shannon are talking about serving up what we want our reps to do. We want to be able to point and click our reps right? In a nice way. I'm not saying they're dumb. What I'm saying is we want to have the appropriate people doing the appropriate activities and a purpose speaks to people's hearts and we're going to give them a goal. So some organizations will have a goal to go public. And then after they hit that goal, it all just kind of fizzles out and everybody goes, oh, it just feels like I'm going to work at a company. So if we have these motions in place and it feels like this movement and motion is constant. Like Brooke was saying, oh, you know what? I'm going to use this content for now, but I also know that I have a team that's helping me. If it doesn't work, they're going to change it. And I trust them to do that. I trust my ops team and my leadership to have dashboards for me that are clear. And I know what I'm doing from a sales person perspective, right? So keep it clean keep it real, keep it up to date. We know the artifact collection and we have a rhythm for our team. And the rhythm is going to be defined by the metrics we have, right? Do not measure everything just because you can. That is silly, right? You want to measure, especially for the people, you want to measure the things that are most important at that time. So phase your dashboards, right? Give people a goal, give people something to look forward to. Do you have a new campaign um, in the times of the, the, the situation that shall not be named right now, right? Is do we have, yep, we just went public, but our goal is to still climb and we wanna hit this number. We wanna hit this many um, net new customers. We wanna hit this many conversations. We wanna hit this much land and expand. Fantastic. We have to identify those goals and that purpose and then those metrics and then you write them as a team. So I'm a big fan of that because what happens is if you do not have buy-in, you do not have ownership. And there's a lot of, oh, well, you did this for me. So now I, 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 I wasn't par a part of it. So it doesn't really count for me. Nope, that's not how this works, right? So when we're thinking about our content, when we're thinking about working with our ops folks, right? Everybody, everybody up and one chair to the left and participate in that role, right? It doesn't have to be forever, but it does need to be for a good 20 minutes to wrap your brain around it. So we're writing these as a team, our goals, what are they, our programs, our, our content. We're determining these goals together. You have buy-in, you have ownership, you have accountability. This is how we build things in, right? Um, and then it's just, it's just like our first or second slide, right? It's a continuous feedback loop that people can trust in that no matter what's going on, I know that I've got a team or I've got a process that I can rely on, I can trust, I'm heard, I'm respected. And somebody, you know, it's not just me having to do it, we're all in this together. Because come hell or high water, December 25th is still gonna be Christmas day. That is a system we can rely on as the calendar, right? So we wanna make sure that we're in this continual motion 
And then from a roles and responsibility perspective, make sure we're taking a look around and setting the table appropriately, given your organization. If you're in a large organization or small, people, we all need to know what to do, right? And we, we did it on this webinar prep. What do you want me to do? <laughs> Where do you want me to go? You know what I mean? So, and, and I've had many, many of, of people that I've reported to, like, Dion, I love all that information. What do you want me to do next? What should we do next? Fantastic, right? So, um, David, we're going to go to the next slide. And, you know, just like we're talking about the four of us, right? It's, it's this feedback loop. And so if you are in a leadership role, you're the sales manager, director, VP, again, depending on where you're at, you kind of own this, right? And like Brooke was saying, from a racy perspective, it doesn't mean you have to do it all but it does mean that you're kind of the, the first and last line of defense for your team. So we wanna make sure starting in the upper left, we have a culture of continual learning, right? So if you are, if you're the executive, right? Chances are you're probably continually learning in some way, shape, fashion or form. It's really up to us to make sure that culture is, is, is cascaded down. It is a professional responsibility for all of us to do continual learning. Not everybody feels that same way, so make sure you hire appropriately, right? So we wanna make sure though that we are in a continual learning environment and we've created it and we've made it okay for people to step up and step into that, which goes to our monthly meeting rhythm. For the love of God, please cancel all your meetings right now if nobody's getting any value and everybody shows up with their laptops and everybody sits back and they've come in with their popcorn and drinks and, you know, treats after lunch. No. So when we're thinking about all these things, Brooke and Shannon have talked about, right? Create a monthly, well, create an annual calendar, right? You're going to have your company's annual goals. You're gonna cascade that to some quarterly goals and from an enablement perspective and when you have your content and your process, you wanna make sure you have a rhythm of goals for a month. This month, we're talking about net new content. When we get net new content, this is how the sales team absorb it. We do a table reading. So people ask me and somebody stop me if I'm over time. I know we worked on our timing. So um, just raise your hand. Um, table reading, right? So I'm a huge Star Wars fan. And when the ninth one came out, yeah, um, I think um, The Force Awakens, that was the background, right? Was J.J. Abrams and the cast doing a table reading of this script. It was amazing. So people ask me all the time, should we script our sales team? The answer is yes, until people know what the heck they're saying. Yes, this is your brand. These are your people. These are your, your, your potential clients. Don't we want them to have a great experience? We need to practice on each other not our clients. So when we're getting new content, right, even if we've absorbed it together and written it together, sit down and do a table reading, do role play. I don't care if people don't like it. You don't get to practice on our clients, right? So let's just learn our words and our verbiage, right? So the famous line of a Princess Leia looking at Han Solo saying, I love you. And he says, I know, was ad-libbed. And it was only, they were only able to do that because they had gone through the script and the scenes and the blocking and tackling so many times. As sales professionals, we don't get to add them until you do your table reading and your practice, right? So just keep that in mind as you're going through your monthly rhythms. And if you're in a smaller organization or even a larger one, if you've got a larger team, you might have someone that just nails it, right? Not everybody's good at everything but you might have somebody that's really good at certain pieces, have them teach it, right? We learn by teaching, we learn by doing. So do your table reading, do your teach backs, do your demonstration. So maybe the first of the month, if you have it, or the first of the quarter is net new content creation. Then the second week is your demonstration. The third week is your teach back. The fourth week is a wrap up. Hey, what worked well? Because then you can do your smart measures at the end of the day, right? So just like Brooke is saying, you're gonna have these KPIs and you're gonna have a system like Shannon was saying. So how do you do that, right? What we don't want is this anecdotal, oh, that didn't work. Well, how many people did you use this content on? How many conversations did you have? Oh, I don't know. Okay. The answer to that is no, you sound like a 10 year old that doesn't want to do their homework. So we're all adults here. We're going to grow up and we're going to do what we have to do to engage and be a professional at the end of the day. So then that's where it kind of goes to our effective meetings and communication loops, right? 
all behavior is driven from emotion and our thoughts. So if we're going, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I like that messaging. Okay, well, what's not working for you? right? And we want to make it okay for people to kind of work through what they've got to work through at the end of the day from their thoughts, right? Our thoughts determine our actions, feelings, all that good stuff. So we want to make sure we've got that cascade in, in, in there at the end of the day and these loops set up so we are able to move frictionlessly with clarity when people say, <laughs> um, yeah, only a woman would say you sound like a 10 year old probably, but, um, but that's, that's what, that's what we're doing here, right? Is, Hey, we've got a team. We're here for you. You know, I get the knee jerk. I get frustration. I get the emotion. What do we do with it? How do we move forward? Right? So it's really about this immunity. It's about a mindset because it doesn't matter if we're all in the same office or if we're scattered at the it's four corners of the world at this point. When we have a system, and like Brooke was saying, you have a system, it makes it so much easier, right? I can still drive, kind of, as long as I'm going to the store, but the lines on the road are still there. They haven't disappeared. So what we're really talking about is, have we throughout our history, and including now, given our team the lines on the road they need, the energy, the injection to keep moving forward at the end of the day as we kind of start talking about into this resilient piece. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Brooke um, to, to finish out our last piece. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the big things we want you guys to take away today to start achieving resilience in your business, right? So when we, we circle this back to the, the content piece here, there's two big objectives I want you to think about when you leave this webinar. One, do we have a tight measurement strategy? And tying that to the desired outcome all the way on the right is, do you know what's working, right? Do we know what we're using? Do we know what's effective? And what's our ongoing measurement strategy here? Think about some of the KPIs I referenced earlier. There's gonna be other KPIs that are gonna be really interesting for you to look at, especially around you know, uh, call measurement as well, just as important as the, you know, written content, um, know what's working there. So define that with your business. And then the second objective, you need a process that allows you to adapt and change. And this needs to be something that becomes part of muscle memory for the organization. And this will allow you to adapt to meet future challenges and minimize the risk of going stale, which is really what caught a lot of us off guard, right? Is, oh my gosh, overnight, we're stale, we're not effective, we don't know if it's working, and we really don't have a direction or a lever we can pull to get us back on the same page and feel like we're in front of the, the wave again, right, versus super underwater. So those are the two big objectives I want you to take away. From actions for that, tactically, you need your baseline KPIs, you need to organize your content, um, get rid of the things that are aged and, you know, don't fit anymore your needs. You'll be surprised when you do those right along and you do see what's kind of getting out there and you do hear what's being shared. So make sure that you're, you're being really open with the organization when you get that feedback and get it organized. And then create that ownership model for your regular reviews. Who's going to own this? Who, um, from a racy perspective, the responsible party that's going to get these on the books? who's gonna be looking at these KPIs and who's gonna get us organized cross-functionally so that we're doing this on a regular cycle, no matter what. This isn't something that stops if business, you know, when and if we return to our new normal. Um, this is something that we keep going for the future. And as far as ownership, again, just to stress the cross-functional nature of this, you know, there's partners across the business um, that can help you. And our teams that work across the aisle really effectively have a lot easier time managing this adaptation that they need to do on a quick pivot because they're able to draw upon minds from other areas of the organization, right? It's not all on our backs, right, to, to write and measure and, and iterate and be visionaries about what's coming and be prescient about a situation none of us have ever been in before. But when you collaborate across the aisle and you bring in those other teams, you're going to get that lift from uh, bringing brains from all sides of the organization together. So those are my you know, tactics today that I really want you to take home and think about to make sure that you're achieving resilience. Shannon's gonna talk about those process next steps as well. Perfect. 
one of the things that we really want you to take away in all of these areas, content process and enablement, is to set a rhythm for planning. So it's really easy in sales to say, we live a 90 day year, we have a target on our backs, we can't think about anything else, we'll do that later when we have time. You have to make time for planning. So looking at different things like territory and account distribution, quota commission plans, I have worked at way too many places and with way too many companies that deliver commission plans halfway through the next year. And guess what? People do the things that you motivate and pay them to do. So you've got to get those things set up and do not let it fall. Do not let your one-on-ones fall. Do not let your pipeline reviews fall. Keep those going. Keep them on the calendar. Cherish them like gold. So your action really is to say, how, will we, how do we make sure that we have process stewardship and governance? So I love an interdepartmental meeting cadence for the same reason that Brooke's saying sales is not done in a vacuum. You can create the sales. Somebody has to deliver on them. <laughs> so we've got to involve all of the rest of our friends and bringing together a meeting. I love once a month, the first Friday of the month, you bring them together and say, here's where we are. How's that going to impact you? What types of things do you need to know? What types of things are you starting to see? Are we selling vaporware? Are there things that we're doing that we can be fixing and coaching our sales team against? Let's take care of that. Let's do it. But you've got to have a standard governance set up for process stewardship. The owner, of course, it comes from executives and sales leadership, but it has to involve everybody else, exactly like Brooke is saying. And your desired outcome really is change management on your process. So it's not like the calendar flips from December 31 to January 1, and all of a sudden you're like, we have a cool new idea for a process. That's not the way that works. Process is iterative and it's in response. We talk a lot about A-B testing. Well, you need to be testing your process throughout the year too. And if your data is telling you something isn't working, change it. Make the change in small challenge pieces so that you aren't overwhelming people with the way that you're changing your process, but stay on top of it and really manage it. That is a verb as well. Look at right sizing your roles and making sure that everybody's doing the thing that makes the most sense for them, whether you've got a small seller shop or a giant one, and make sure you're both efficient and effective. <laughs> you can be <laughs> efficient. I can shoot an arrow and every time it can hit the target, but if it's not hitting where it needs to hit, then it's not effective. So use your process to decide, are the things that we're doing with our sales, with our sellers, both efficient and productive, effective, and that will bring you true productivity. Dion's gonna wrap it up here, and I would suggest everybody just take a picture of this and create one of these for your organization, except fill in the things that you're going to do. Absolutely, and, and I think that's what it is, right? It is about immunity and resilience and, and the governance and, the systemization, right, and the harmonization and true focus at the end of the day, right? So sunlight is amazing and it can bring a meadow of flowers to bloom. Otherwise, I can also harness that sucker through a, a magnifying glass and start a fire. Don't go start a fire, but I hope everybody understands the analogy at the end of the day, right? And so it's the same thing. All of these components are super, super important. They're really um, more effective when they're done well together, right? So we want to, again, make sure we're starting from left to right, looking at our objective. These may not be your objectives. What are they? So here's some examples. It's easier to edit than it is to create, right? We don't want to have meetings just to have meetings. We want to be able to, to go into a meeting to be able to form business relationships with our peers, right? So these are our second families half the time. So we want to make sure, though, that we're not to the point where we're comfortable, where we're not speaking truth. So we want to make sure that we have some baseline um, table stakes, if you will, for some of those meetings. I'm a big fan, too, of scorecards, right? So how do we test and measure? We can look at open rates. We can look at reply rates. We can look at, I'm a big fan of if you do campaigns, you measure progress against and in that campaign. How many people have we talked to? How many accounts have we targeted? You know, you can definitely progress through that. I think the other half of the coin, though, for the sales rep, we want to make sure that our reps are, are considering themselves to be professionals. And every professional I've ever known has a scorecard, right? There's a ranking at the end of the day. So how well do we do our skills at the end of the day? Um, we want to talk about the rolling out of that. Are, you know, how are we holding our meetings? How are we doing with our communication? Do not cancel your one-on-ones, 
right? Nothing screams, I don't care about you more than canceling your one-on-ones. So you really need to make sure we're engaging both at the people level and the number level, right? So we want to make sure we have that dichotomy. And sometimes there's a healthy tension between the two. As long as it's healthy, it's okay. And we need to make sure our owners are all on that same page, right? Whoever that may be for you and your organization, you need though executive buy-in, somebody that can help um, give some uh, error cover, if you will, and you need to make sure you've got some strategic components, your tactical components, scorecard rating. People will say, okay, how do I get promoted? How do I do this? How do I do that? Scorecard rating. And so just some of your desired outcomes, again, will be dependent on you and your organization, but you can't measure funnel velocity if you haven't worked with your ops folks to figure out how to calculate that to begin with, right? So um, same thing on the content side, right? So if you change certain things, you have to have constants within your formula at the end of the day. So you know when you change some of the variables, what that impact is at the end of the day. So with that, I think what we're going to do next questions right now, but we also just thank you so much for joining us. We are so appreciative that you all took the time out of your day and we're happy to take any questions. Please feel free to reach out to David, Shannon, Brooke, or myself. We're always happy to talk about these things. Um, we can point you in the right direction of resources and other folks to talk to. So with that, thank you so much for this. David, do we have any questions in the chat or Q&A? You're muted. <laughs> Let's unmute. Uh, no questions. We are right up against time. We really appreciate everybody attending today. Um, I hope this was as helpful for you guys as it was enjoyable for us. Um, this has been a real labor of love. I feel like I've learned a lot over the, the last few weeks of working with these folks. Um, so super appreciative and just really uh, just great work, guys. Likewise. Thank you. And I think we'll send out the recording to everybody, right? Yep. We will uh, look for us on LinkedIn. We'll have the, the deck we can share. Um, yeah. Perfect. Brooke? Absolutely. What a wonderful experience working with all of you, especially uh, you two ladies. It's been fantastic to be on a panel of women talking about skills. So uh, very exciting, but thank you so much. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. We hope you have a wonderful day. Shannon, any parting words? Thank you, everybody. And please do. We said, add us on LinkedIn. We love it. We love to interact with sales professionals. Yep. So thanks for pulling us all together. And thanks for your attention today, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Take care.